I'm Tim Ellis, and thank you for joining us for Laneway Live. Tonight's guest is an author, a publisher, an innovator, a performer, a musician, a magician. He's the man who put the close into close-up magic. Please welcome Michael Close. So Michael, where are you right now? It looks like you're in a, a TV studio or something. Uh, this is the basement of my Fortress of Solitude in the Great White North, uh, where I have hunkered down and I have been uh, uh, down here. Uh, well, here's the interesting thing. I mean, the only difference between now and pre-COVID-19 is that I don't drive my daughter to and from school in the morning and the afternoon. But otherwise... This is basically my life, sitting in front of a computer, writing stuff, or the little set behind me is where we shoot some videos for the, uh, the uh, targeted training things we do and for uh, various ebooks. But I'm, I'm mainly a solitary person, have been for quite a long time. We can talk about how that all developed. But anyway, uh, I'm uh, just north of Toronto in a little town called Richmond Hill, one of the uh, part of the greater Toronto area. And uh, we're all healthy here, so I'm happy about that. And are you having to do homeschooling? We're starting that now, yes. Uh, the last week, uh, the previous week, was my daughter's spring break. And school would have started again this week. So we're very uh, painfully uh, trying to get her doing academic things just to try to uh, start a, a normal schedule of events. It's really been uh, very difficult for her. A lot of the people I've talked to have said that this whole situation has been really rough on the kids because, uh, you know, they do have the benefit of the very technology that you and I are using right now to keep in touch with their friends. So it isn't like they don't ever get to see their friends, but the fact that they are not face-to-face -face has been something that's been kind of tough for her to deal with. And also the fact that... Uh the word is that the kids aren't affected by the virus uh, as much as the older people. And so they seem to think they're a bit invulnerable and should just go out and have fun anyway. I'll tell you, that is such a profoundly dangerous attitude. And uh, I would hope that everybody would wise up about that. I mean, it, it simply emphasizes uh, a lack of understanding of how math works that, uh, you know, Yes, okay, maybe maybe you won't get sick, but if you're carrying it, then the odds are, you know, likely that you're going to pass that on to somebody who is, uh, whose health is not going to be able to let them get through it without serious consequences. But, you know, at, you know according to, oh, we're not talking politics, I was going to make a joke, so, but I won't. But I won't. No, no, we'll, we'll avoid the little stickly topics. We'll, we'll avoid the political humor right now. We'll, 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 we'll say happy things. Like, for example, you've been doing magic now. I mean, you're, you are literally a living legend of magic. You've been doing magic since 1978. Uh, I think I met you just after the workers' books started coming out. And the workers, if, if, if there's any magician who doesn't have the workers' books, well, I don't think you can really call yourself a magician. 
Oh, well, that's very nice of you to say. Yeah, I, I actually uh, got my first magic tricks when I was five or six. Um, my dad worked in industry and we moved around quite a bit. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and we moved around from uh, to about the time I was four or five and ended up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is in the north uh, east, uh, northeastern corner of, uh, of the state of Indiana. And there's a magic shop there called Stoner's Magic Shop, owned by Dick Stoner. Do you know Dick? Have you met him? I do, I do. And it's such a weird title for a magic shop. Even though it's his name, it's just... <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. Back then, it didn't have the implication. But now it, it, it sounds like uh, the magic shop that uh, supports the underground uh, magic club or something like that. Um, but I will say, uh, Dick Stoner was a, a big influence on me. I saw him, he performed at my grade school. I was probably in kindergarten, maybe first grade. And to this day, I recall some of the things that he did. I, I especially remember he did hippity hop rabbits and killed me with it. I just couldn't believe the ending of that trick. Um, and lots of other things. Anyway, when I was six, uh, we went to the magic shop and I got some tricks for my birthday. And we've actually been friends ever since. Dick is still around. I think he's almost 90 years old. Uh, he really, uh, you know, he's just a go-getter. And the thing that was so great about Dick Stoner was that he never sold me anything that I couldn't handle. He was really good about gearing the material toward where you were. Uh, and he was also uh, very big on reading. Of course, you know, that was, what else were you going to do back then? I'm talking, this was like 19... Gosh, when was it? Late 1959, 58, 59, I guess. So um, we moved away from Fort Wayne and moved to a little town just north of Indianapolis, which is in the middle of the state of Indiana. And from that point on, I got, you know, they drove me up there maybe once a year or twice a year. It's about a two and a half hour drive. But I ordered books from Dick Stoner. And that's really when I got deeply into my appreciation of, of uh, magic books. Uh, partly it was because we didn't have a lot of money and, you know, I go, well, here's a $10 prop, one trick, here's 60 tricks in Harry Lorraine's close-up card magic. I'll take Harry Lorraine's book. And I, it's been that way my entire life, having that preference uh, for uh, reading over everything else. And yet things have <coughs> changed so much now that people just want to buy one trick with an instant download instead of maybe a book or a DVD, which has got 20 or 30 tricks in it. Well, uh, one of the things that I've been, you know, it's always been a mission for me to try to uh, emphasize the importance of reading uh, for several, for many reasons. Uh, one, just the, the, I mean, the how much you get for your buck factor is, is a big thing. But also because it, whether people like to think about it or not, magic is an intellectual hobby. Uh, because I'm going to, I'm, I'm battling your intellect. I'm basically going up against your ability to take the clues that I offer you and from those clues make a decision about what happened. So it's, it, I'm, we're real, it's battling intellects. And in that case, you have to be as smart as you can possibly be. And reading is something that increases your intellectual ability, I believe. It's, uh, it's important that you're able to take what's on a page and turn it into something in three-dimensional space. I, I know a lot of times when I get on my high horse about this, you know, kids would come up to me and they say, well, I can't learn from a book. And they say this to me as if I was, it was something genetic, that I was born with the ability to learn from a book. And it wasn't. It was a, it was a struggle. Um, I, I grew up in a household where there were always books, lots and lots of books, so I, I love to read. I do less of it now uh, than I should really. But I remember, for example, I wanted to learn, boy, I still remember this routine. In one of the Lewis Ganson routine manipulation books, I think it was in one of the paper bound one rather than that hardcover one, there was the Ken Brook cup and ball routine. And I really wanted to learn that. Well, if you've ever tried to learn cups and balls or something complicated where your hands are, are holding props and you're trying to read from a book, you can't do it. So what I did was I read the instructions into a tape recorder and then just played back the instructions so I was talking to myself and that sort of eliminated that, that
that factor. But uh, when I was a kid, I remember going to uh, the Toledo Public Library. My uh, grandmother lived in Toledo, and uh, I didn't have a Toledo library card, but they had the five volume, individual volumes of Greater Magic. You've seen that set rather than, it, it was published in a couple of different ways. One is, of course, the giant hard, hardcover book, but then it was published in five very attractive little volumes. And I remember copying that out by hand, uh, you know, spent a couple of weekends. We, every time we'd go up, I'd go into the library and find a different book and write stuff down. So uh, I, I'm, I'm a, I really think it's an important kind of thing. And I still plug it as much as I possibly can. Well, if you look at some of the most uh, successful magicians around, they've often had struggles when they start off in learning magic. Some were, some were dyslexic, some had reading disabilities, but they struggled through that so they could learn their art. And I, I think about Ong Yul Lee, uh, you know, the, the Korean magician who's very, very famous. He uh, told me that he had to start off by translating because the books were not in Korean. So he had to actually learn English and translate the books into Korean before he could learn the magic. And it's when you, when you go to that trouble, I think you value your knowledge a lot more. Well, it's, uh, you know, that's, that's an excellent example. And I, my hat's off to people who can do that. Uh, it's almost like, you know, as, a, as a, a musician who enjoys playing jazz, one of the things that you can do that is really one of the most beneficial exercises you can do is to transcribe jazz solos off the record. So you find a musician who's playing you like. And uh, back in the day when I was doing this kind of thing, uh, I would have to record the, uh, take the record and transfer it to reel-to-reel -reel tape. My father had a reel-to-reel -reel tape player that played at 15 inches per second, seven and a half, and three and three quarters. So you record it at 15, and then if there's a lot of notes, you can slow it down half speed. But of course, when you do that, the pitch drops an octave, and everything gets muddy, and it gets a little more challenging. But I would say I probably learned more about how jazz works from doing that than anything else I've ever done. Uh, trying to play jazz and it's just because it's so painstaking and your brain is actively engaged the whole time well for those who uh, who don't know you are also a very accomplished musician and I think the last time we saw each other was in Beijing where you were playing between all of the acts at the world championships of magic oh well uh, there, there's a story I got a call in um, it was early 2009 maybe something like that from um, Hank Morehouse. Now, Hank Morehouse was helping the Chinese uh, organizers book the talent for the 2009 FISM in Beijing. And he called me and he said, I would like you to do the music for FISM. I, and I said, so you want me to be Frank Wilson? And he said, yeah, Frank doesn't want to do it. I, and which, which really probably should have been a big clue for me, but I didn't really pick up on that at the time. Well, you should explain and I said, who Frank is for the, for the people who don't go to FISM every year. Well, uh, Frank Wilson, I don't know Frank. I've never seen him work. I've only been to one FISM, and that was the one in Beijing. Uh, Frank is a talented musician. He sings. Uh, I think he's from, is he from Netherlands? I don't remember where he's from, but he, because he's European, he knows all the popular songs of the various European countries. So, because the stage acts don't have a master of ceremonies, they use music to keep the energy up between the acts while the curtain comes down and they change scenes. And so Frank can really get a crowd going because he sings all the popular songs and he really works them. And he makes, so references. Said, he makes references to the acts too. I can remember one act accidentally set fire to the stage. And of course, as the curtains close, he's playing Baby, can you light my fire? <laughs> <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, I did that a couple of times, jumping ahead in the story. Uh, there was a woman, uh, I think she might have done a magic quick change act. She was probably a woman in her late 30s, maybe early 40s. And when she finished, I played uh, Your Mama Don't Dance. And... <laughs> I was the only one who got that. <laughs> and then uh, after one bird act, I played uh, When Doves Cry. I, uh, I, I did that one a few times. So I did a little social commentary. But anyway, uh, so I said to, I said to uh, uh, Hank Morehouse, I said, well, I'll do it. 
as long as you understand I'm not Frank Wilson. I don't sing, I don't know, nor am I going to learn the popular songs in Europe, uh, nor am I going to learn the popular songs in China. However, I can fill the room with some classic rock and roll and put down some good grooves and play. He said, okay. He said, so what do you want? So I asked for a ridiculous amount of money uh, and a hotel room, of course. And what I thought would be the deal breaker, I wanted a business class flight from Las Vegas to Beijing. And I thought, okay, that's it. It's done. I've he, eliminated. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want I didn't to. want to do it. It was yeah. the perfect negotiating because I didn't want to do it. So a week or two later, I'm looking at my email and my wife hears me go, oh, shit. She said, what's the matter? And I said, oh, I'm going to Beijing. And what I wasn't aware of was that the Chinese government was pumping so much money into that convention that they could afford that. So anyway, there I was, I found myself in Beijing. Now there's a much longer story, uh, which we can roll around back to, but it was a very tough convention for me. There were technical things that went wrong, incredibly wrong. And if you talk to Gay Lundberg, who was the stage manager for the contest shows, he has more horror stories than I do from that uh, particular convention. But uh, all I remember is in Magic Magazine, uh, Wittius Witt wrote, uh, Michael Close didn't look like he was having any fun, so we didn't have any either. Um, <laughs> and the, uh, the only song that I played, I remember the entire time I did it, that got any kind of an audience reaction at all was when I played Always Look on the Bright Side of Life from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And all I could think of is, you people don't know the words. <laughs> So anyway, that was Beijing. I think, I think there's probably a small contingent of people singing along to that. <laughs> Quite possibly. Quite possibly. Now, the, uh, the other thing you're, you're known for, sort of as a little underground secret to an extent, is your connection with the Penn and Teller Fool Us show. Uh, yeah, we did uh, season seven of uh, Fool Us from February 28th to March 13th. We lost a few of the acts because they couldn't get here, get, couldn't get to the United States. So there was some scrambling and replacing of acts because people just couldn't make it. And then there were some acts that had a real tough time getting home afterwards. I was uh, really you know, concerned about the whole thing, but I made it back without a problem. Uh, I have been in self-isolation since I was in the United States. I haven't been out of the house really, except for walking the dog. Um, the crew was incredibly conscientious about hand washing and keeping distance and making sure we didn't do that. And I've been checking in with everybody since I got back. Nobody seems to have any, uh, any symptoms. But the way that that got started, my working on Fool Us, uh, I moved to Las Vegas in 1998. And uh, shortly after I got there, Johnny Thompson uh, brought me in to work with Penn & Teller just on the stuff on their stage show. Uh, and so he and I worked as their main consultants the whole 12 years that I was there. And I had my fingerprints over on a lot of stuff that they do. I worked on uh, Selfish, where the phone ends up inside the fish. Uh, and that was sort of my idea of, of taking the close-up trick, you know, card in box and turning it into a stage trick. And fortunately, Penn & Teller have a really great crew who could turn my you know, I basically wrote Superman Flies and then hoped somebody else could figure out how to put that on film and to get it to work. But I did that. I did TSA. Um, the Vanishing Cow that they do was a trick that I was involved in trying to figure out how that was going to work. So um, after, I, uh, after we moved to uh, Canada and the CW Network picked up um, Fool Us for what would basically be season two, shot in Las Vegas, Johnny suggested that I come on and uh, work with him as the as one of the two magic consultants on the show. So this is the sixth year that I've done it. And uh, it's, it's really gratifying the response uh, from magicians. And I think they appreciate the fact that uh, I'm really proud of Fool Us. Uh, once everybody gets their head around the idea that the fooling of Penn and Teller isn't the reason for the show, it's the reason the show got on the air, but it's not the reason for the show. 
Uh, everybody can be a little bit more cool about the fact, you know, and I say to the guys who seem to be kind of hung up about this, I want to fool Penn and Teller, I want to fool Penn and Teller. And I say to them, don't you understand that you got hired to be on this show? You've won. A plastic trophy is not going to increase that. You've won. But, you know, ego gets that. But, and, and then what I say to people is, if you really want to learn how to fool Penn and Teller, Look what Helen Coughlin's father has come up with for the times she has been on the show. Because these are not tricks where you're trying to guess which of five methods somebody's using. There's no answer for what he does. You look at the stupid escapes and you go, well, what the hell is that? How does that work? I remember the, uh, the one that was on uh, the last time Helen was on was kind of, she was escaping from one setup and Teller was trying to escape from an identical setup. Well, when Helen said in the audition video, I had no idea what she was doing. I looked, I was completely fooled. I had no idea. So when she got to Vegas, uh, just for the people who don't know the process, uh, one of the first things that happens when the acts get to Vegas is they do a rehearsal in a room that's called the Belize room. It's just the name of a, of a conference room that's just, down, uh, just off the hallway as you walk into the Penn and Teller Theater. So anyway, she does this escape for us, for the producers and the director and everybody who needs to see this. I got no idea. So she and her father take me back behind this screen afterwards and they show me how it worked. And I could not stop laughing. I could not stop laughing. It was such a great, unintuitive method. And then when she went on the show, well, she fooled Penn and Teller, and then they went off stage, and I can hear them because I've got a headset, and I'm hear, listening to their mics. She says, I hear her say to them, you want to see how it works? And they go, yes, we want to see how it works, and they could not stop laughing. They were just in hysterics the whole time. So a lot of effort goes into the show. Uh, I started work on it in October of last year, and because, you know, since Johnny died, uh, in season six, uh, Johnny collapsed and had to go to the hospital the very first day of rehearsals. So the, really the first full day of working of a two week shoot and he was out of commission. So I did that two weeks by myself and uh, I also did this two weeks by myself and because I knew I would be doing it by myself, I uh, tried to do as much pre-production work as I could to make things as easy as possible for myself. And, there's always craziness with Fool Us, and there's always things that you don't expect to have happen. But uh, it went okay, and everybody got through it. I think it's going to be a fun season. The reason I brought all this up is that uh, all the production team, you know, uh, the producers and director, what have you, we were amazed at the people who, when they ended up fooling Penn and Teller, were overcome with emotion at it. And I mean, this was not showbiz. They were actually moved to tears that they did that. And that's really kind of gratifying that it's become such a, you know, such a thing. Uh, and they were all legitimate fools. I, I, with one exception, they were all really legitimate fools this time. Um, Amazing show. And I mean, you've had uh, Matt King, you've had Richard Turner, you've had uh, Copperfield on the show. Is there anyone you haven't had yet that you really want to get on the show? Oh, there's, there's, there's bunches of people. And, you know, I had to twist Tom Stone's arm for months to get him to submit a video because I really wanted to do the trick that he ended up doing on the show, which is the three box trick. And, uh, you know, whose box is this? You know, this is the thing that Tom does. And I thought it was just brilliantly constructed. And I really thought it was going to fool Penn and Teller. But what I hadn't counted on was that Teller knows more about drawer boxes than just about anybody I've ever heard of in my life. It's, it's nuts. I mean, he played with all these ideas that Tom has incorporated in that trick. So uh, Tom sort of got beat all the way down the road, and I was very surprised by that. But... On Facebook, Tom posted that, you know, the video of that has gone, he's got more than half a million hits on that video. And I said, gosh, who in the world talked you into coming on that show? 
it's a it's a great sort of career move for magicians. I know oh, that Dom, Dom Chambers. Oh yeah, I remember Dom. He's done tremendously after after he did Penn and Teller. He was sought out by America's Got Talent and then ended up on The Illusionist in Broadway. Yeah, I think uh, America's Got Talent uses us as their farm team or something. I think their their entire research for doing their show is go, hey, who's fool us got on? Oh, I haven't seen that guy before. Um, but I think the other thing that, that magicians appreciate is that, uh, you know, when I was a kid, uh, and matter of fact, living in this little town just north of Indianapolis, my only lifeline to seeing magic done was the magic land of Alakazam. And that show was really important to me. And I remember reading about how difficult it was for Mark Wilson to sell that show to the network because they said, people aren't going to believe you're not using camera tricks. And of course, I don't even know what defines a camera trick in the late 50s, early 60s. I don't know what that means. But I do remember that they made a great effort to say to people, what you're seeing on TV is exactly what people are seeing in the studio. And that lasted for a long time until magicians on TV started to cheat that in ways that really destroyed that trust. Uh, and what Penn and Teller, uh, what Fool Us has going for it is, since the goal of the magician is to fool Penn and Teller, apparently, well, there are gonna be no camera tricks. There's not gonna be stooges. There's not gonna be pre-show work so that what you're seeing is what uh, is going on. You know, we never edit for deception on, on Fool Us. For, so what you see on TV, it may be tightened up for time, but we never edit for deception. That's not the purpose. And it gives, gives the magicians a fair shake. It's the most, <clears throat> most credible of all the magic shows. You know, you've got I believe so. other shows where people are like, oh, I guess that's just a camera trick. But with Penn and Teller, everyone watches it. They love it. We actually had, um, I mean, they've got such a huge fan base in, in Australia. We had them coming to the Sydney Opera House and then Teller had his injury on his back. And so, then this uh, happened. And then this happened. So, yes, I've, I've, I've had uh, two sets of flights and accommodation down the drain, but uh, I'm still persisting. After all this is finished, we hope they will somehow be able to reschedule and visit us again. I know. And they were, uh, just on behalf of them to all the folks who listened to this, they were bitterly disappointed that they weren't able to get there. Uh, the good news for anybody who wants to know is Teller is feeling so much better. And uh, of course, uh, you know, we were very careful in terms of selection of material for them to do to make sure there was nothing that was going to, you know, re-injure him or anything like that. You have to, you know, factor that in. But compared to some years where he was in a great deal of pain, a uh, great deal of back pain. He was chipper and, and everybody was having a fine time, but I know they really are disappointed they weren't able to get to Australia. I'll, I'll make, mention two things about the show. One is people do come up to me and they ask questions about Fool Us. And one of the questions always is something like, how could Penn and Teller have been fooled by that? Or what's going on with that? And my answer to that is always, there's a story behind that. I can't tell you that story. Magicians, uh, my point is, don't get bent out of shape about anything. It's television, it's not important. Uh, it's fun, it does magic a good service, and don't worry about the rest of it because it's not important. It is a fantastic showcase for magic though. We actually get to Great. see fire acts instead of little three minute clips. Well, yeah, I don't. I want. I don't want to discuss competitors, but we do give the magicians a fair shake in terms of how they're edited on that show. Absolutely. And and speaking of little tricks, do you uh, do you have something to uh, to share with us? Uh, I really don't know. Um, I uh, I don't. I mean, I, I will give a little plug. Um, I've been tipping. Uh, you know, I was trying to figure out something to do to keep myself. You know, occupied. I have uh, I have a couple of projects that are um, uh, uh, going on right now. We've been doing these things called targeted trainings, and the idea is is that I can take a narrow subject and go very deep into it, which to me is is the most interesting thing to do. I mean, when I was out lecturing for magicians, 
one of the, one of the problems with with lecturing is is that you have to gear your lecture to reach the broadest possible knowledge base. But you never know what you're going to hit at a magic club. I mean, I, when I first started going out lecturing for magicians, by the way, this story is a long way of me going, no, I don't have anything to show you. But uh, maybe by the time we get to the end of it, you'll forget that you asked. Um, what, when I first went out doing magic lectures, uh, and I still lived in Indianapolis, the musicians that I hung out with, you know, uh, hey, Mike, can you play a wedding reception on Friday? No, I can't. I'm going to be in Sweden. Sweden? What are you doing in Sweden? Oh, I'm doing a magic convention. I'm lecturing at a magic convention. And so my friends would say, you're lecturing for magicians? What's a, what's a magic lecture like? And I would explain. Suppose that a concert violinist comes into town to play a concert with the local orchestra. And he decides, since he has to be there a few days, he will hold a master class on afternoon. And attending that master class are some of the professional violinists from the town. If there's a college, maybe there's some graduate student violinists, let's say they're, it's, he's a violin player, maybe some graduate student violinists, maybe undergraduate violinists will come to this, talented high school violinists will attend this master class. There will be people who own violins. There will be people who have heard of the violin there will be two trombone players and a clown. And that's exactly what a magic lecture is. You have, you have no idea the common shared knowledge base of the group you're working for. So consequently, you have to water everything down and you also have to factor in, how am I gonna sell stuff while I'm doing this? Well, these targeted training things, I don't have to worry about that. You either like the subject or you don't like the subject. But if the subject interests you, we're going to go really and dig deep in that kind of a subject. So uh, I enjoy doing those. I learn a great deal as I uh, prepare them. Uh, I think we've done six or seven of them now. And I got another one in preparation. And what I've been doing since the uh, self-isolation at 4 o'clock on, uh, that's Eastern, U.S. Eastern time, 4 p.m. each day, I do a little 10 to 20 minute live video and I just talk about something. So some of the guys have been uh, asking me, you know, questions and sometimes I just tell stories, sometimes I just tell a joke. Uh, and these have all been a lot of fun. I've sort of been digging back into my old notebooks. I used to keep a notebook when I was a young man. So uh, today, for example, I uh, tipped a trick of Jeff Busby's. In some small way, I said, you know, this isn't going to make up for those of you who got ripped off with the Browley notebooks, <laughs> but it's something. Um, and, and this has been fun for me. I, you know, I go back and find some difficult, you know, some interesting things, tell some stories. And I've been learning some things. Um, one of the things is, uh, see, I'm just keeping from having to do a trick. I just keep talking and you forget you asked. Um, so I guess I just say, no, I don't have a trick to do it. I'll just keep talking. But um, one of the tricks I want to talk about on this little uh, live video thing I do is a trick of Vernon's called Aces to Order. And it's not a trick that people are familiar with, but it was in the second of those, and I have one here because I'm at my desk and I've been preparing stuff, uh, that great book, the Guy Vernon Chronicles. Uh, books. It's in the second one of those. And Vernon uh, was really one of the very early exponents of doing effects that have multiple outcomes, what magicians now call multiple outs. And he was killing everybody with this back in the, you know, 1913, 1920, 1921. Um, the interesting story is the reason that he got interested in that is when he was a kid, he saw a magician um, take a handkerchief and uh, he would say to, he had like six different handkerchiefs and he said, pick a color. And somebody said, the yellow one. So he'd make the yellow one vanish and he'd open up this little box that was on stage and the yellow handkerchief was in it. And this completely fooled Vernon until he came back the next day and when somebody named a different color, the orange one ended up someplace else and then he realized that he had six different ways to end the trick 
So anyway, my point is, is that this aces to order trick is an example of a trick that has multiple procedures. You're going to find the four aces, but you find them in the order that the spectator dictates. And the procedure sort of changes. Now, the reason I bring this up is, uh, as part of the work I do uh, with uh, memorized deck magic, part of that uh, that I'm very much known for is uh, what I would call spontaneous performing or something that wasn't planned. Uh, I originally called it improvisation, but that's the wrong word. So lately I've been using the word riffing. Uh, and I won't go into detail about why I changed my mind about all this. But the point is there are a lot of people who, if the script isn't laid out and the procedure isn't laid out strictly from A to E, but you have to change things in the middle, there's a lot of magicians who aren't comfortable doing that. And this is a good trick to practice that because it's limited in scope. You're just dealing with this revelation of the four aces and it's a really good one to practice. And at the end of that trick, when there was down, when you're down to the, the last ace that you have to produce, Vernon would use a trick called the slap trick. Are you, are you familiar with this? The Vernon slap trick? Because of being on the other side of the big ocean, you might not be, but it's a trick that Vernon did hundreds of times at the Magic Castle. He would take an ace of spades. Well, let's see. If I stand up, can you see cards? Yep. All right. So he'd take the ace of spades and he'd say, I'm going to put this in the deck somewhere. Okay. Give me a number between 1 and 52. 7. Only 7? Yep. That's a small number of cards. And he'd slap the deck. And then he'd count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. <laughs> and there's the ace of spades. So, you did have a trick. <laughs> I wasn't planning on it because I hadn't practiced it. So, but literally, you can do that with just about any number. So, there's an aspect of that trick. I never saw Vernon do this trick. I only encountered Vernon on a few occasions because um, I was in the Midwest. He's out in California. And as I'm reading the description of this, I said, boy, I don't understand how this works. Now, the good news is uh, because I'm calling up everybody and talking to him now. I called John Carney because I knew Carney must have seen this done. Uh, and I said, do you remember Vernon? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what did he do? How did he handle this thing? So Carney told me what he remembered. And then I called Howard Hamburg, who was also around from, he, he met Vernon in 1970 and knew him till Vernon died in 92. He, of course, remembered the trick, but his Re recollection of the handling is different than what John remembered. So I have two different ways to go, and what I showed you was the way Howard remembered the trick. So it's a good trick. I mean, it's a it's a really good trick. And so in the course of this is these little things that I'm doing. It's sort of like the targeted training. I learn more than everybody else because I'm going back and finding this stuff and 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 you know refreshing myself on it. But that's a wonderful trick. That slap trick. There's a story about it that uh, Vernon claimed he never missed. He said, I never miss, I never miss, I never miss. And he would do it one of two ways. He'd either do it as I showed you with the ace of spades, or he'd have the spectator take a card and control it where he needed it. You name the number, he slaps, and the card is that number. And they were trying to get Vernon out of the castle to go eat something. And he said, no, I want to do this trick. I'm going to do this trick. And they said, well, look, if you, if you miss will you go to dinner with us? And he says, okay, sure, take a card. So Howard Hamburg takes a card and puts it back in the deck, shovels it up. He goes, give me a number, uh, 17, bam. And now Howard's, uh, Howard lies. So Vernon counts down to the 17th card and says, what was your card? Now Howard took the seven of clubs. He says, it was the queen of hearts and lies. So that they'll go to dinner. And Vernon turns it over. It's, it's the 
queen of hearts. So I never miss. You never miss. <laughs> I never miss. It has been an absolute delight chatting with you. And uh, we've gone way over time, but that's all right. We, we're going to have to do a part two at some point. And, and I think we'll be, in, uh, we'll be in this sort of situation for uh, a few months to come. So uh, there's a, a very good chance if you're up for it, we will, uh, we'll come back and revisit you. You'll probably still be sitting in that chair. Well, I, I basically, uh, this has been the, uh, the Titanic of interviews. I mean, you only hit the tip of the iceberg on this it's it's really good to see you again tim it's been way too many years and thanks for having me if i was too long-winded i apologize but you can do like they did with the evisons and cut out all the code <laughs> words and uh, everything will be fine well we will we'll put all the links down down the bottom for everyone to uh, check all the references you've had but thank you so much bye bye thank you tim Thank you.